cross the line Are you out of your mind? Don't cross the line Everything will be fine Don't cross the line And good morning, everybody. Welcome to Peggy's Place here at KGOA in Wallala 88.3 FM. I'm Peggy Berryhill, along with the fabulous Lee Ann Lindsay. And our special guest today is Michael Baron Weick, one of our great architects in the area. We have a very interesting show for you today. I think you will enjoy it uh, because it talks about something we we mention a lot and that's renewable energy and building homes but what happens when they come together so we're going to talk about that before we get started Leanne, just a short brief announcement all of right I, you know i just want to send our condolences to everyone in boulder yes. and to the family of the slain officer officer tally uh, the Boulder Police Department today read the names of the victims who ranged in age from 20 and 24, and, and the rest were up in their uh, 60s, basically, people who just went to the store to get milk or eggs or whatever and uh, didn't come home. And uh, it's just very, very tragic. And, of course, the shooter, uh, the person who's been ar uh, arrested is 21 years old. Um, I and I also am very struck by how the Boulder Police has been handling this, and maybe it's a, a good lesson for uh, the handling of these things and not immediately releasing all the names and uh, making right. a big deal about right. the shooter. Um, because uh, I think that may encourages too many other people and uh, and is hard on the families as well. So, definitely, anyway, well, our hearts go out to them and uh many of us have friends and family we in do. the boulder area so it's nice that they've been checking in on facebook and letting us know that they are safe uh some friends i had who shop at that store regularly and whose grandchildren go to school nearby so anyway let's all you know take some time out remember this and let's let's learn and uh, it's already been i mean it was a week ago just a week ago, we had the killings in Atlanta. So let's um, take a deep breath and see what we can all do for our society and to comfort those who have lost loved ones. Yes, and I too checked in with my friends because the radio station I was on in Aspen, uh, some of them went on to Boulder. And so we checked in with them as you did with public radio. I was in commercial radio back then, but we just send all of our condolences out to everyone in the Boulder area. All right. Well, with that, we're going to take a breath <gasps> together, a collective breath, and we're going to talk with Michael, Barron, Wyke, and Leanne. Tell us something more, something people may not Oh, no, about Michael. <laughs> well, I'll tell you all about Michael as Peggy there answers the phone. And uh, Michael has been on the vanguard of the green design movement since its inception. And he studied with the pioneers of this new school of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. And he has gone on to lead residential and commercial projects throughout California. His immersion in California's remote coastal regions has in formed his aesthetic and practical approach to design both of which emphasize comfortable, elegant, human scale designs that work in harmony with the natural surroundings. And his work has been featured regularly uh, in Architecture Week, Catalyst, House Beautiful magazines, as well as the Santa Rosa Press Democrat and the North Coast Seroptimus also uh, carry events where his work has been featured. You know, and uh, we thank you for that that uh, introduction to Michael. And those of us who live here on the coast uh, are very much influenced by architecture, as Michael was, and it's got him interested in it. Uh, I, I just have to give a sh nod to that community to the south of us, the Sea Ranch, which uh, introduced a concept of living lightly on the land 
uh, how it is now is a lot different from it, how it was uh, started. But Michael, um, were you influenced by that concept of Sea Ranch when you got started? And good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, Peggy, definitely, uh, as a freshman, I, I had already told Leanne I was uh, at Worcester Hall <clears throat> in Berkeley and quite nervous about what was coming up to learn how to become an architect. So above the elevator that goes up to the ivory tower of the architects. Uh, this is uh, at UC Berkeley. At UC Berkeley in Worcester Hall um, was, uh, were illustrations uh, in black and white freehand of uh, a landscape. And the landscape showed symbols of wind currents and um, uh, some buildings tucked into these tree uh, hedgerows. And it, it was uh, basically a graphic teaching to us as students about work that Larry Halperin was doing for Castle and Cook, a subsidiary of Dole Pineapple at the time for the Sea Ranch concept. So this was in the early 60s and the first building had not even been, the first residence had not even been built yet. So little did I know that a few years later, one of my professors, Joe Escherich, uh, was the one who was chosen by Larry to design the very first six demonstration houses at the Sea Ranch uh, that would give the style and the concept of living together on the land and leaving the bulk of it open for commons use by the rest of the people that, that bought into the development. So luckily, uh, uh, many, many, many years later, 2011, uh, an, an owner came to me and wanted me to remodel his home and completely take it all the way down to the plywood. And so I went to Black Point, where these demonstration houses were, and there was <clears throat> Eshrick's house sitting in front of me, waiting to be redone. And it had not really been touched except for a few windows since the 60s. And it had the, according to the owner, the very first building permit on the Sea Ranch in 1965 for a residence. The condominiums had been done, but not the residences. So I spent two years uh, with the design committee and with the builder and the owner. And we basically tried to keep all of the elements that Joe had um, used uh, so tactfully in, in the way they were, the house was sighted into the hedgerow and then open it all up more to the views of Black Point up the coast and opening up the rooms to each other so you could live in that house all year round and not just part of the year as it, it really lended itself to when it was first designed. And you were selected for a People's Choice Award for this redesign. Correct, the local Redwood Empire chapter of the AIA uh, chose uh, my design as one of the renovation, uh, the renovation and remodel uh, category that they have it was chosen a uh, People's Choice Award. I just wanted to let our listeners know too, if you'd like to check into YouTube, we are also live on YouTube. Just go to the uh, YouTube uh, link and Google or search for KGUA and you'll see us there. And we are streaming around the world at 88.3 FM on KGUA.org. And I just wanted to let everybody know that we are talking with Michael Baron Weick, an architect who is doing some very influential uh, energy independent design with this architecture that he was influenced by from the very beginning from the Sea Ranch concept. So that is something that we're talking about today. All right, and uh, just a, a brief reminder to people who may be tuning in uh, and are not familiar with, we keep talking about the Sea Ranch. The right, Sea Ranch, good what point. does that mean? You can <laughs> look that up online. We're not going to go into great detail about the Sea Ranch, but it was, uh, it was and still is an innovative 
housing community. And it was located out here on the Mendocino coast, uh, a long ways from San Francisco and uh, had just celebrated their 50, second, I think they're going into the 53rd year, and uh, but very influential in the concept of living lightly on the land and the combination of the types of homes. But that's a whole other story. However, if you do take the tour, there is a, there is a walking tour of the Sea Ranch, you will see the Escherich home. Well, let's, let's kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, Michael, to why you're so interested in building homes that are energy independent. How did you get involved with this whole concept? Yes. Well, it's a, that's an interesting question, Peggy. And actually, when I came here, I didn't know. And I actually didn't want to be an architect. I had been drafting and I had been... Uh, drawing for an architect in Berkeley. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle being at a drafting table day after day after day. I have a lot of energy. I've always been very athletic and an outdoors per type person. So I was uh, actually came here because um, my girlfriend at the time had a, a brother who went to UOP in Stockton and a professor of his owned 135 acres up here that his parents had bought in 1935 for 50 cents an acre. And it had not been lived in since the 50s. So I did the classic back to the earth, you know, um, move and came up here and became a caretaker with my girlfriend of this 135 acres. But it had no electricity. And all of the plumbing and all of the windows were broken out by by vandalism, everything. So I had to basically become a, a quick and fast study maintenance and repair man. So during that time, uh, I spent a lot of time kind of learning about nature, had the whole earth catalog, uh, listened to Alan Watts on Sunday mornings for spiritual guidance, just read uh, Dr. Suzuki's Zen Buddhism, just the whole nine yards. Huh. And in that process, I, I discovered that I didn't really have to worry about creating something from nothing with my ego or my mental capacities. I just had to pay attention to the environment that I was in, pay attention to, the, to what was in front of me with the people's needs if, if I began you know, working again in, in uh, construction or architecture. So that became kind of my foundation. And as I evolved it, I, for example, I worked with a couple of designers in, in uh, drafting around the area because I decided I needed to keep my feet in that. I, um, I worked with some builders, uh, apprenticed myself to some builders, uh, very beginnings of just digging trenches and, and pouring concrete. And then evolved into where I was working with uh, the St. Ors group for a couple of years. Um, doing the, I designed the site plan, I designed the uh, entry arbor, uh, uh, trellis work, uh, helped to build the cupola towers. And that was my last <clears throat> job where I worked for anybody else. Now, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it, but I knew that it was not my destiny. So I went to Europe for three and a half months where my parents had been, uh, had immigrated from uh, England and Ireland uh, be, uh, during World War II. And I went back and I met all my relatives for the first time. And during that three and a half months that I was gone, I spent two in, in Europe and six weeks in, in the British Isles. I came back on fire. I, I knew who I was. I knew what my who my ancestors were, I just, I just knew what I needed to do. So I started, I opened up my own design practice, I bought a piece of land a year later, and I got married a year later. I just, just everything just took off. And during that time, I, I decided, well, what would I do? What, what would be my focus? And, and I thought, well, the environment is, is clearly the influence that came from Berkeley. Clearly, it's even more so living in it for six years as I was. And so I decided to call myself environmental design 
and I was going to focus on solar design. But I didn't, I didn't want to do equipment. I didn't want to do mechanics. I wanted to do the organic part of, as we live here, that just like the Native American Indians, we can, we can collect that energy from our surroundings with as simple a process as possible because it's the most durable and it's the, it's the most effective. So that's why I went to passive solar design as opposed to active. And then gradually over time, as California became more conscious of this movement, the solar movement evolved into the sustainable green movement. And Build It Green uh, created their own sort of evaluation process for buildings uh, that would be sustainable. So that included materials, it included being fireproof, it included clean air, it included high efficiency furnaces and water heating. All these things now kind of fell into my lap because that's the direction I was already going. And so now it's a matter of just selecting for performance and cost effectiveness and appropriateness for the, for the job and the environment that it's in. All these different components with the best artisans that, that I can find in the area. And over the years, I don't switch around. If I find somebody that really that we're on the same page, I stick with them. And that comes out to be what you saw yesterday. We really enjoyed taking a tour, Peggy and I did, along the property that is your current project. Why don't you describe a little bit first about where it's located, kind of the position of the property, and also what it took to get that project started? Uh, gladly. <clears throat> well, the uh, this site, uh, I've done several uh, Ocean Bluff projects and all up and down the North Coast. Um, the trick has been uh, to kind of balance my work between Sea Ranch and off the Sea Ranch. So I decided to focus on uh, coast properties because it's so challenging to, um, to get coastal, coastal Commission permit approvals. So I've kind of become a, a go-to architect for people that want to get approvals for coastal permits because everything I've done is, has been approved. Uh, and sometimes it takes years. This particular property had been sitting for quite a while. It had been developed, uh, but not finished uh, back in the eighties uh, by a man named Michael Tuck. And then it was purchased from him and this old kind of dilapidated unfinished structure was sitting there on the property. It's all wooded. It projects out into the ocean and it, it looks almost due south because the coastline here is tricky. You think you're looking west, but you're really looking more south because it sweeps out to Point Arena and, and so it, it ends up making the land uh, reach out to the west and, and therefore looking to the south, which also leads to better climates because uh, as everyone knows that lives here, the weather's much better uh, south of Point Arena during the summer than it is north. There's a lot more fog and overcast. And so this particular property, two and a half acres, was sitting there. It had been used many years ago as a launching uh, point, similar to other places along the coast, for the dog hold schooners. And uh, so this was so, uh, divided, by the, divided up by the McNamees. My clients, the Fallows, bought the property back in, I think, 2016. <clears throat> and um, I had been on it three times before with other uh, hopeful buyers, but it fell through an escrow or fell through it one time or another. So they came to me, and um, I knew just about everything there was to know about the property and where you could build uh, with all of the natural environment being protected. And uh, I said, uh, well, I hope you want to do an energy efficient building. And they said, well, that's why we came to you. So as we started working, it became very clear that we were on almost exactly the same page as each other. We really wanted this site to, to be a witness to this incredible ocean down coast view to Haven's Neck, to um, put its back up against the Northwest winds which are prevailing during the summer and lend for an indoor outdoor living space that would be naturally heated by the sun 
and then powered by the sun also electrically with, with solar panels, powered also for hot water and heating system by domestic hot water panels. And the whole thing integrated with clean materials and the exterior wrapped with a completely fireproof skin that would be as durable as possible. And that's what you saw yesterday. It's a, a beautiful location. Uh, obviously, they're, they're on the coast. And the home, as uh, you explained, even you know, more beyond the beauty uh, of the interesting design, the practicality of it, you know, and all the thought and care you put into choosing the, uh, the tiles or the uh, rocks on the outside, the solar uh, uh, panels, everything, all the thought that has gone into this house is what also makes it so very interesting. Uh, is it often that you get the opportunity to expand and just ex express uh, in building a home all of these principles? No, as I said to you yesterday, <clears throat> I think the thing that uh, this one epitomizes, which happens on other jobs, but this one in particular, is that each element that you saw that, that had a particular character to it was, um, was created by a, a team. The, the, the primary influence for uh, a lot of the material selection was, was not only mine for the exterior, but also the owners, the fallows. And um, then their consultants, the people that they used, they went out and looked for the best people they could find. For example, uh, the lighting designer they found out of Mill Valley, they'd seen her work in Sonoma. And so they brought her in to work with me uh, and she did a beautiful job. Um, there's an interior designer that who um, uh, Rebecca has known for years and she's been involved. But I think the difference is we weren't all working under our own ideas. Everything kind of got bounced off of each other, including with the builder, John Schmidt, uh, Schmidt Construction. And then in turn, all of his subcontractors, uh, the tile setter, Eric, and, and uh, just everybody. So this job has been going on now for almost two years and it's not typical, uh, Peggy, usually they last about a little over a year and the number of, uh, of um, independent people, landscape architect we have on this one, I don't usually have one of those. Uh, interior designer, uh, a lot of times I'll do interior, the interior design work, so we had one of those. Um, so that, there were a lot of extra people on this job. But when I first started out, I wanted to do a job similar to the Sea Ranch Architects, where it would be uh, an energy efficient home that anyone could afford. That it would be uh, a concept that is not unique to a particular class of people. It would be usable and learnable and functional and inspiring enough for anybody as long as they can actually afford to build. And that's, of course, what's getting to be more and more difficult as the cost of construction gets higher and higher. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there for a moment because I believe Leanne is, is now sharing on our YouTube channel a few of the photos from yesterday. I will go to do that right now. I've got a couple here. I was looking for the rest of them to show the magnificent view, but at least I believe that the screen is sharing so any of our YouTube watchers can see wh what we're talking about. It's up on a prominent point overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And we don't have the shot that I really wanted that looks south towards Haven. It's Haven's, Haven's Neck. Neck. Uh, but it's a very stunning view and the home you can see now that is looking at it from the waterfront going forward and then from behind towards the water. And as, as Michael Baron Weick was showing Peggy yesterday as we toured the facility. Uh, and yeah, that would be a good one too, Peggy, if you can get that uploaded to their Google Drive. But um, the... The home, though, when you first introduced us, Michael, uh, tell us something about the exterior that we're looking at, the tiles, the stone that's in place there. Yes, it's, it's a unique product uh, for me to use. It's the first time, but it's, it's, uh, 
it's actually been used for, for a while now, mostly in commercial. This is called an, an open joint uh, panel system. And um, this particular panel is, uh, that, that was chosen is actually stone that's been crushed and then a, a, a heated, a rolled and pressed back together and kind of fired almost like a tile. And it comes in four foot by, or five foot by 10 foot sheets, but I had them cut into, into four pieces so that they would be easier to handle and install on the building itself. <clears throat> but it's completely fireproof. Um, and very uh, important for all of us these days living in a drier climate that's very well, combustible. Yes, and actually it's, it's required by code because this is what they call the Wui district, which is a wild uh, wildland urban interface a fire district, which is in unincorporated portions of all of California. So this, uh, this system of, of exterior fireproof materials is, is pretty much being required everywhere <clears throat> with different products, of course. So behind this panel, uh, these panels, is, it's all open jointed, is, is a fireproof uh, material that's a one hour fire resistance uh, with a vapor barrier that's got like a 25 or 30 year warranty on it. Uh, all of that is, is uh, behind these panels with an airspace uh, that's the panels are actually glued to aluminum strips that have been screwed uh, to the framing. So this, along with the slab and the metal roof and the fire treated fascia uh, and uh, uh, the tempered uh, glass windows uh, and the metal frames that are all a thermal break, all this makes the exterior of the building completely fireproof. Yes, describe how there is a space in between those tiles and yet there's the firewall behind that. Yeah, that, that actually is a concept that's, that's returned, if you will, to the, to the building industry. <clears throat> if you remember yesterday, I said that uh, the Sea Ranch uh, modeled itself after the, the barns of, of the uh, rural uh, architecture of the area. And they, they did because they thought that, look at how durable these buildings have been. Well, one of the reasons they were so durable is because there was air behind these boards and air behind these shingle roofs because they were unheated spaces and weren't enclosed. As soon as we started enclosing buildings and putting materials on top of plywood that were wood, the, the backside would never dry out. The roof shingle would never dry out. And so they started cupping. And it's notorious for anyone that lives on the sea ranch that if your house faces south, in five years, you gotta replace the siding because it's all cupped. So by putting an airspace behind all these different materials, the roof, the, the siding, et cetera, it gives a breathing to the material and it can dry out evenly on the front and the back. So that's why there's the rain screen. Well, we, we're uh, between, you know, Leanne and I, of course we take dozens of photos <laughs> and, yes <laughs> and uh you know are uploading uh, different photos of the uh, interior and some of the views uh and we do have the north and south view with us along with the interior of the house uh, it's time to remind people that we are talking to michael baron white one of our local architects but he is working on this house if you drive north of um uh, anchor bay and just a little bit you will see actually two huge magnificent homes that are being built and Michael is responsible for the design of both of those and he took Leanne and I on a tour of one of those homes yesterday because he wanted us to uh, understand the energy efficiency and what you can do now obviously and, and this I'm going to go back to something you said just a few minutes ago the point is this is also about learning and while you and the fellow uh, family are lucky enough to be able to do everything that they can uh, with their plans and with their design and with their money it will benefit others farther down the road who won't be necessarily building a magnificent home like this on an outcropping at the ocean. Correct. But as we go into the future, the importance, the lessons are learned for those 
perhaps even we would hope even working class or the so-called middle class, because, you know, it's kind of gotten blurred there between working class and middle class these days, uh, but that we will all become energy efficient home homeowners of energy efficient homes as we go to the future because the planet needs it. And I worked in the tech industry from the mid 80s to the early 2000s. And you can see how technology at the very beginning is so expensive and is either from the military, from NASA, from uh, from large corporations who can afford these things or into individuals too. And then eventually over time, it trickles down to others in a much lower affordable cost for more of the masses. And that's what we're hoping to see with these kind of energy uh, efficient homes going forward. Right, Michael? Yes. And, and actually, I started out that way. Uh, Lee and Mary Hershberger's house built in 84 um, was featured in, um, uh, let's see, which one was it? One of the uh, home magazines. And it, the cost of that construction, it was built by Helmut Emke. Uh, and actually, it was uh, Darren uh, Iverson's grandfather, who was the electrician. Um, that house cost no more than any other house that was being built at the time. And it was completely passive solar. It's the one that I had David Wright, uh, formerly of Albuquerque, New Mexico, a passive solar architect. Um, consult with me on. It's the very first one I did. It's the first house I did after I started my practice that was uh, solar. And the cost of it uh, and many homes after that were, were no more than, than uh, other homes that, that, have, uh, that have been built at that time at the same time. So yes, this one has all the bells and whistles, but there's no reason why this, these concepts can't be used for anyone. As long as they have the exposure uh, to the sun, they can collect that for free as long as they have, uh, you know, uh, a setting that will uh, give them, uh, I guess, relative shelter. So when you're in the middle of the trees, you're being challenged, but but then you have to come up with other more creative ways. You can over insulate or you know uh, go to a more efficient equipment in the home. But a lot of these things now are actually required by California. It's not even just a nice idea. You can't have a home that doesn't comply to certain energy uh, standards. So these ideas that, that, I'm, that I've been pushing have actually been adopted and now they're, they're what everyone else has to do. So you know, go ahead. Well, I think it's really interesting. The, in some ways, the irony that you're working with an architect from the desert uh, out here on the ocean and yet there are some similarities in terms of water supply a lack of water and the big winds yes that you get in the desert we get big winds of course they have the heat uh, and uh, you talk about albuquerque and santa fe are known for those famous um oh gosh i just lost the term for those uh uh homes that, that have been built uh, ships some kind of um Anyway, they're very, you know, innovative in how they've used energy with tires and sand or hay or yes. whatever, whatever they've done to become energy efficient. So, but oddly enough, there is enough of the similarities in terms of building with the challenges is what I'm talking about. The lack of water and, and the wind. Uh, here we, in the desert, they're completely exposed. Here there might be some uh, safety with trees uh, and uh, brush around, but uh, you've learned from each other, it sounds like. And you've also talked about incorporating that wind in energy as well. Yeah, that was uh, the, one of the things I was pointing out to you guys that I'd like to see included in this project in the near future is that it's an ideal site for a wind turbine and the wind turbines are getting so um, <clears throat> understated now, quiet and efficient that um, a couple of those, um, you know, tucked into the trees and now you can powder coat them to match any color you want um, could end up adding up to 40% or more of the total energy of the building uh, when it's raining and when it's nighttime, uh, so no sun. And so there's a way to uh, make, and, and the cost of the wind turbines is quite nominal. I, uh, the ones I'm looking at are about $6,500 a piece uh, without the um, installation you know, costs. 
but um, that total package and, and having the possibility of varying systems to different degrees certainly makes it very attainable for anybody to at least get half of their energy that they're expending, if not more. This one will be a zero energy use house um, in you know coming back to them so they can put it out into the grid if they can't store it, they can put it into batteries as batteries get cheaper. And so eventually we'll become more and more independent from this grid that's getting so big that it's gonna fail with the demands that are on it. And I wanna repeat what you reiterate what you just said, a zero energy home. That's right. Yes. It will and make as much energy if not more than it uses. And you also incorporate the aesthetic of the land so that these energy efficient solutions are not domineering the space. Exactly, you can't so tell there. Explain how those, because some people's mind, you think windmill and you think this enormous thing that can cause damage to wildlife or something like that. So describe what you were telling us about yesterday. Well, the turbines that I was describing are actually about eight feet tall. They're, they're uh, suggested to be put on an eight foot pole so you don't walk into the blades uh, if they're on the ground. And um, the blades are each one maybe about eight inches wide and they rotate on a horizontal uh, rotation and they're absolutely silent. The, they don't uh, endanger a, a bird migrations because they're low to the ground. They're not up in the air like the big giant ones you know, over in, in the valley uh, that you see on the way to Stockton. Um, but uh, they also are, are designed to, to take uh, winds from five miles an hour up to 100, 150 miles an hour uh, with a maximum output at 15 miles per hour. And so, you know, it, it's kind of a no brainer as long as, you know, they're made of a material that can stand up to the salt and that's a key um, in this climate. And, and Peggy, your, your idea or your suggestion about um, how this building fits in compared to the, to the Northwest. Well, the Northwest's biggest problem is cooling. So they, they had to really build earth roofs over a lot of their structures and use the homes. Yes. Yeah, yes. To, yes. Uh, sod roofed homes to, mm -hmm. to uh, cool the home. In this case, thank God, which has made it much easier for me, cooling is not a major element of concern because I have the Pacific Ocean. So the venting process of having windows that open uh, on the lower floor and then skylights that open on the upper floor gives a natural you know, venturi when they're open to just let out any excess heat that might come from the day and keep the house from overheating from its passive solar design. Well, and I have to say, as we were touring yesterday, I mean, it was very comfortable, uh, although it did get a little warm. And then of course you demonstrated the opening of the, the vent downstairs, the upper window, which, which you and Leanne were great at. You could reach it, I'd have to have a ladder. But just opening that, that window from the top instantly Yes. made such a difference, such a with, difference. The, with the wind. Yeah. Uh, I, and that is the thing that we, we want to keep emphasizing about this type of building is really taking advantage of the natural landscape around you yes. to heat or cool your home. Exactly. And, and uh, as I told you too, the mechanics are there where they're needed for the water pumping and for the heating system for the floors but the house itself is passive. It waits for the energy to come to it. It doesn't keep sort of drawing and pumping and all these mechanics uh, that, that some of the earlier solar homes had. You can't tell that this is a passive solar house. It just is. And that to me is, is a key where you're, you're getting the views, you're, you're being inspired by the environment and yet you're letting the environment in to take care of you. So let's do move into the interior and talk about some of the interior design, how you bring this in, and also some of the cabinetry work that you were able to help to incorporate into this home. 
uh, with pleasure. It, it was a coincidence, actually, that a lot of the finishes inside were chosen. But as you know, uh, you know, the key element to a success of a home is how does the kitchen work and how do you live in, in connection to your social life and still cook? So most of the homes up here have great rooms, which is the combination of the living room and the dining room and the kitchen. Um, and this particular one, um, I was very excited about because uh, there was a, a, a style of kitchen cabinetry that I had seen about 15 years ago uh, with uh, a trip to San Francisco for other reasons. And the cabinets are made by Studio Becker. It's a company that uh, has several showrooms around the world in, in major cities. But their work is the most beautiful work that I've ever seen. And I had a, a little cabinet shop for a while when I was um, up in uh, at, on that ranch. I, I created my own little cabinet shop. So uh, I asked the, uh, the fellows, now that I've designed the kitchen and, and the vanities and so on in, in these rooms, do you have a cabinet maker in mind? And they said, well, yes, we, we've looked for uh, one. We found someone we really like. And I said, that's great. Can I also show you a catalog of another company that I would like you to at least look at and consider for ideas? So I pulled out Studio Becker's catalog that I'd had sitting in my office for 10 years. And uh, they said, well, that's strange. Those are the people we chose to be our cabinet makers. So I was elated and, and I took it further and said, well, okay, then here's a style in here that I would like you to consider. And there's this big sliding door panel that's on an up, upper uh, cabinet uh, in the kitchen that's spectacularly dramatic. And, and we have that image downloading right now so that we can bring it up on the screen so anybody watching on YouTube would be able to see it. So go ahead and talk about that while we wait for that to, to process. Okay. Um, it's uh, basically, it's a sliding panel of a, about two and a half inch thick piece of wood. There it is. We got it. <laughs> and that's great. And it slides over that glass portion. The glass portion slides behind the wood so you can get into that part. And then the wood slides over the glass so you can get into the right hand side. But it, I, I, I hate to have to interrupt you, Michael, because the audience can't see this. But the when you say uh, the the piece of wood is dramatic, it's kind of trapezoidal. Yes, uh, looking and and uh, this cabinet again, I must say, is built for tall people. <laughs> yeah. I just have to keep emphasizing that being yes. a short person. But <laughs> it's it was it is beautiful. So it's half and half. Half you will either see half the glass, or you will see this beautiful piece of wood. Exactly. And, and the, the rest of the cabinetry, of course, lends itself with it. And it becomes basically the, the architectural um, sculpture work, if you will, of this great room, uh, along with the fireplace, which is not completed yet, but it's, it's getting closer. We have a picture of that also coming down the stairs as there's a little bit of a, a look at that in the skylight above, but we have another image too, more of that. And I'm trying to find We're going to have to figure out how to get all these posted. Uh, yes, so we're going to post them on our Facebook page <laughs> and yeah. on uh, and on some other places as well. There, there we go. go. We've got yeah, the is. room right now. You know, th this is an interesting uh, element that actually was inspired by Rebecca uh, Fallow um, and working with um, a Studio Becker. Um, she, she, at first I had had a, a central uh, wall area that was just the fireplace with the windows on each side. And she said, well, I'd like to put a window behind it and I, and, but have a fireplace in front of it. And I said, well, how, how will that work where the, the fireplace blocks the view? Uh, it, even though my design would have, would have blocked that area also, but it would have been part of the wall. She said, well, I want to make it so it's open underneath. So when you're sitting down, which, you know, there's not a picture here, you can still see all of the ocean uh, on the couch. And then we'll have a TV screen uh, on the top uh, over the fireplace uh, veneer that the, <clears throat> that wall of where the fireplace is will be covered with a wood veneer. Um, and then so we can see the view as we're sitting down. Well, 
it sounds like, and I'm not sure, but right now tentatively, my wife suggested, well, why not put a video cam on the opposite side of that wall outside of the building and then have it wirelessly connected to the TV that would show this ocean view <laughs> behind it. So the fellows like that idea a lot. I hope it, they follow through, but that way you'll kind of have uh, the best of both worlds where you'll have the fireplace and the view together. We were rather surprised. <laughs> right, the, blue, the view would would be blocked. Now, this is when uh, Michael talks about a fireplace. This is a six foot wide by uh, what is that about four foot wide narrow uh, piece of structure. Uh, I'm not sure what it's made of, and yeah, the glass uh, and the gas fire, and there, there's no nothing surrounding it. It's just going to be open. That is a really cool though. Uh, look for the fire as the flames would come up and there's no glass or anything. It's just out in the open. Exactly. It's got the neolith base and then there's a, a gas a burner that's six feet long and the hood, of course, is eight feet uh, wide uh, above it. And the there's a blower that's up in the top of the chimney that actually pulls the air from cold air intake that's uh, put in through the concrete slab and up under the gas burners. So that way there's no inside air that's being taken up the chimney. There's, you create, if you will, a wall of air that's flowing cold from the outside uh, into and under this chimney structure where the gas is, and then all of the flame and the cold air with it uh, go up the chimney. Uh, now let that, me, me I'm sorry, I just would, for the, for the audience who, who uh, it has it's been staying with us or just joining us. What we are, two photos that we're sharing with you. One is looking down at this massive great room uh, that on uh, one side, of course, has the kitchen that you, you talked about. Um, and, uh, but this is now looking west. There is this huge tr fireplace. There are windows surrounding the room, big windows with those window vents on top. So you do have a view all around, but oddly this beautiful uh, shaped fireplace, but it's obstructing what would be the view of just the, the Pacific Ocean, just the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> <laughs> which we all love. So uh, that's what makes this design also so interesting and so unique and to many of us we're wondering why uh but but the family who lives there they have their reasons and they like it and there will also as i understand be quite a large tv screen there and uh but possibly the opportunity to also just run a camera and see the view anyway yeah and and on each side each window when you're on each side of course the view is there so you're right. really block blocking just the middle window but I think it is a unique, I kind of struggled with it, um, but I, I now that it's in place, and especially when I sit down and uh, or squatted yesterday as I did, <clears throat> you can, what I wanted to make sure is that if this happened, that when you were sitting, that for some reason, I didn't want to miss the horizon line. Right. And I wanted to see the horizon and, and we did, we made it happen where we could raise it far enough and put the hearth low enough where the opening I think is like 24 inches. And so when you're sitting on a couch at couch level, you can see the horizon. So it's, it's gonna be, it's different. It's just, it's different, but I think still effective. And the screen having with my wife's idea, if, if it, they follow through with that big screen and then the view already there, I mean, who cares? Right, right. <laughs> And look on the, if you're watching on YouTube, we do have photos up of what's to the south there of Haven's Neck and then to the north. And that is a view that wraps around this house that you see yeah. on both sides. Yes. And I want to go back into the interior again and some of the design that you did on the railings and the way that the stairs go up. We do have a stairs shot, but also the glass partitions so that it allows more of the outside in. Good. So tell us about those glass partitions that you made a decision to do. Okay. Well, um, there was a, on the, the first one that kind of started the thought of, of the glass rail was that the upper, there, there are two bedrooms in the main house and then there's a third bedroom that's over the garage, which is a, an extension that's, uh, you know, closer to the, to the highway. 
but I, I didn't take you up into that other room, by the way, the views in that other guest room are better than they are in the house as far as looking at Haven's Neck. Um, next time you guys can go with me uh, and see it if you like. Anyway, um, uh, as I was completing the drawings or heading to the engineer, Rebecca came and said, Michael, could, could we put a balcony off of the upper bedroom? And I was in the middle of construction work and I went, uh, my heart kind of sank and I thought, you know, damn it, it should have a balcony. I thought about doing it, but I didn't want to put it right over a living space because I was worried about leakage. But I said, you know, you're right. That would make that bedroom just so much more dramatic, but I don't want the view blocked. So I lowered the pitch of the roof and I put in a half wall and then the rest of the wall I did just in solid glass panels, tempered glass with no frame. So when you sat down or stood in the bedroom, you still had this beautiful view down the coast of Haven's Neck, like you see in the upper left-hand photograph. So that inspiration went into the study, which is the next room uh, next to it upstairs. And you look down from the study into the dining room. But there are uh, two stories of glass looking again towards Haven's Neck here to the south. So we said, well, why should there be anything that obstructs that view at all? So that view is all glass that has no frames and is just um, connected to the floor with a very rigid uh, structure that's designed by um, C.L. Lawrence or C.K. Lawrence, I forget what the middle initial is, but that basically that way when you're in the room or looking down into the, uh, uh, into the dining room, it's, it's all glass. We've got a very large picture here with me in it, but I'm trying to resize it because this is the one that shows that glass partition and the stonework is incredible. Uh, that is the one thing that really drew me to this house was that stonework as well. And this is the outside deck you're talking about. This is the about. outside deck. Described. Yes, yeah. now you can see the glass panels that I used for the outside. Yes, absolutely. It, and, and the thing that was so also, Interesting again with the design because yesterday afternoon, if many of you remember, it was a bit breezy. Yeah. And here we were outside. It was warm on that deck. We were not getting any wind and this deck looks south uh, toward Haven's Neck. It was a very comfortable place to be. That the, other, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but the whole home, uh, the floors are heated by radiant heat. Oh, that's a great one. Correct. Yeah, the, the lower floors are concrete, the upper floors are wood, but, but um, there's a radiant uh, tubing in, in the, uh, uh, that's made by, uh, it's not warm floors, but a company like warm floors. And then that has tile put on top of that. <clears throat> so the great thing is when that floor gets heated up, that the tiles or the eight inches thick of concrete, which has insulation underneath it, will all be a heat mass. So the floor has to be heated only at about 60 or 62 degrees to, to accomplish a 68 to 70 degree comfort at, at basically chest height because heat rises. So whereas most people had a forced air system where they were blowing you know, 70 degrees or 68 degrees or more in the whole room, this just heats the floor and it radiates up and your feet really want to be cooler than your upper body does. But your feet are warm because they're on a warm surface. My so, feet would love it. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> they're <radiant>. too cold. <laughs> radiant floors, there's no draft, there's no dust. They are more expensive to put in, but they're more efficient to operate. And therefore, over the long term, they're actually cheaper. And you know, Michael, I, I have to interrupt you again because we've only got about five minutes exactly. left okay. and I, I wish we had more time to talk. I would just say that radiant heaters, uh, radiant floor has improved so much. Uh, if anybody is familiar with it in the older days, it was a problem, not the same anymore. So with these last five minutes, what else do you want to emphasize? Well, I, I think that what brought me to you guys immediately, uh, besides just, you know, pride in, in the work, is that um, there are a lot of people that are migrating here now because of uh, COVID and because of high Absolutely. speed. Absolutely. And because of high speed internet connection. And they're, they're, they're urban uh, refugees like I was, like all of us were, are. And um, 
this is a chance to be able to uh, tell people that this, this place on earth, uh, amongst any other natural environment that's primarily natural, is an inspiring place to live. And, and in being able to live here, you can do dwellings that will continue to inspire you um, for your work, for, to raise your children, um, just to have a different attitude about your connection to, to this life. And that's, that's what I hope to do with my work. That's what I hope that people will find when they come here, the same thing I found, where there's something more than just doing a job, raising some kids and, you know, living in a house. And so this is a way to, to, to consider the quality of your life and, and changing it from an urban environment, which is much more what I just said. It's, it's you're punching the clock and you're doing certain things just to make, just to make it. And here you can just step outside. You don't have to do anything and you can get inspired. So by having a living space that inspires you, by having an environment that inspires you, hopefully it'll make for a better world. I don't know. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to get in touch with Michael, uh, he does have an office right here in Wallala next to Trinks and above the gallery. And how can they contact you otherwise, Michael? And this is to all of our listeners out there on the stream at kgua.org, on Radio Garden, or any of the other ways that you're watching us, maybe YouTube today. Uh, how can they get in touch with you? Well, uh, uh, certainly they can find me on uh, house.com. I've got my some of my mo more recent work on, on that site, which has connections to me. Um, I'm, I'm on, you know, just Google me and, and find my phone numbers and so on. Uh, I found you on LinkedIn. <laughs> and, on, and on LinkedIn. I uh, used to be on, uh, oh, I think Google had their own, uh, 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 you know, web page for, for uh, professionals. But certainly you can find me that way. And uh, uh, I'll be happy to uh, consult with people if they want, or I'd be happy to... Uh, just let them know what it takes. You know, and I also want to add that uh, we, we have a show that's currently on hiatus, but Sevi Cardosi interviewed you on her show um, several years ago. The Drift. Uh, the Drift, about yes. your trip to Ireland. And it is such a wonderful show. So fascinating. We'll have to replay it sometime. But you talk about how going home and regaining your heritage inspired you. Yes. It's such an interesting, interesting show. So that's another. Oh, I'm glad you like that. Peggy. Oh, I think we'll, it was we'll upload it to SoundCloud and send a link out on our Facebook page. And I, I know that we're right, right out of time, but I know that mm -hmm. getting any of these designs past the Coastal Commission or if you're working on a home on the Sea Ranch, you've got the Sea Ranch Design Committee, DCEM. It all takes time and effort. And these are things you've been doing for a long time. Exactly. I have. And I'd be happy to help anyone do it. I guess that's going to have to be it, Michael. We yes. just thoroughly enjoyed the tour between we our did. photos. We'll figure out how to get an album out here. And uh, uh, thank you for your decades of you know work that you're learning how to do this. And and I just have to to say once again, I really look forward to these these innovations coming to people who you know are looking for more affordable housing it's wonderful as you say to be able to work with people who can push it to the max it yeah, was yeah. lovely seeing that but for other people and as the world trickle gets down hotter and hotter <laughs> well right. let's, let's try and make that trickle faster that's right with government <laughs> assistant or corporate assistant whatever it takes well um, one, one last comment uh, there's a there's a plaque i found when i was in ireland peggy uh, in a little gift shop and it was just small enough to put in my suitcase and i have it over the door of my office and <clears throat> it says i'm still learning michelangelo so I put that up there and I thought, well, what the hell? Why not be inspired, you know? And, and it's true. We're all still learning. And that's Thank a you. great way to end today's Peggy's Place. Thanks so much for joining us today, Michael Barron White. I'm Leanne Lindsay, along with the famous Peggy Berryhill for Peggy's Place. You're listening to KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM. And have a wonderful day, Michael. You too. Thank you, guys. Okay, okay, bye bye. Bye. And now we're going to go over to Native America Calling in Progress here on KGUA 88.3 FM. 
and looking out at sunny skies here on the coast, talking about our Northern California coast. Let's see what the weather says while we wait for Native America calling. And it looks like it is 54 degrees. It is going to get up to 61 today. And here we go with Native America calling. <laughs> <laughs> 